Aloha, everybody, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios for another amazing episode of Security Matters Hawaii. My guest today is a sought-after speaker nationally, internationally. She's an expert in child exploitation, and I'm happy to have Perry Aftab join us today. Perry, thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it, Andrew. It was a very kind intro. The, um, the internet has caused a lot of people a lot of problems. We hear it constantly about uh, business compromise. We hear the cybersecurity breaches. Um, adults have their own set of responsibilities, but children are often just not aware of, of everything that's thrown their way um, as far as compromising them, compromising who they are, um, exploiting what they do. Um, so we're going to get into this, and I know this is, for, for I think for everyone, it's sort of a difficult topic, and I think that that's perhaps why it doesn't get the discussion that it deserves. So thank you again for joining us today. What's, what's your take on the conversation? Is it gaining traction? Is it getting broader? Well, there are two parts of the conversation. One is what you talk to kids about, uh, about how to be safer, privacy settings, protecting their own reputation, respect for themselves and others. And the second more serious issue is what happens behind the scenes. Uh, the creeps that are out there, cyberbullying, death threats, uh, putting somebody's head on someone else's naked body. Those are a lot more serious. And we talk about that less on television and in the media uh, than we should, because that's a very difficult conversation to have. Yeah, and is, do you think that it, it is it because it strikes home? I, I think that most people don't do this, and so they're shocked that someone would. So they'd rather sort of hide from it, maybe, perhaps, rather than address it head on, take those conversations home with their own children, or, or make sure that these conversations are being had in their schools. Uh, what's your feeling about, about that? Well, I agree. They're very hard conversations. A lot of teachers and others who do programs in schools, and even parents who want to talk to their kids, don't know how to do it. And they also feel intimidated thinking the kids know more about technology. They may, but we know more about life. So we need to recognize the risks. At the same time, you have the industry that's trying to play down the risks. Uh, you'll talk to a lot of cyber safety experts who've been in it almost as long as I have, 25 years. And they'll tell you that it's not really happening because they get a lot of funding from the Googles and from the Facebooks to say it's not happening. So. The conversation needs to be had in the same way that good touch, bad touch needs to be had, and what you do online stays online. And at the same time, we need to have these conversations with professionals who may be able to stop the real cyber crimes from occurring. Yeah, and in, in your experience with these with these um, platform owners, um, what, what's I'm sure they're not trying to promote this behavior, but what's your sense that they feel responsible for you know the their tool being leveraged and and you know do they say well that's just the way it is or do you think that there there's an active effort to um, you know find and take down people that are being predatorial or posting um you know in, in, inappropriate um targeting children with inappropriate material well um vint cerf the man who invented tcp ip the internet um, has put together a group called the People-Centered Internet. And there are a few of us he asked to get involved. I tend to be the cyber safety, not smartest person in the room. Everybody else is a scientist and brilliant world leader. Um, but he is trying to make sure that the digital technology that he helped construct can be used in positive ways and not used in, in dangerous ways. And uh, Tim Berners-Lee, the person who invented uh, the web, it has the same thing. He has an NGO that does that. Now the industry, our parents, they're people too, and they care about these issues, but they care a lot more about being free of liability. And there's a law in the United States called the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, that gives absolute immunity to any of the providers for whatever they yeah. do to keep things or take things down in their own judgment. They don't have to do a thing and you can't sue them about it. Yeah. Now child porn the images of child sexual exploitation are exceptions to that. But there are a lot of things, cyberbullying, uh, videos of deaths and, and self-harm that are not covered by those exceptions. And as long as they don't have liability for them, they're only going to do what's good for business. Wow. Is there an appetite for a change to that law? I know, you know, you're, that's the perspective that you bring to this issue. And I know there's an appetite probably from the public, but, but what about the business community and, you know, the shareholders? 
Well, you know, it's interesting. The digital providers are lining up. So the IBMs and Cisco's of the world really are unhappy about the tech lash that we're seeing against the reputation of all tech providers. Ah. And they want to do something about 230. So they're really doing the right thing and they're on the hill talking and they're talking to me and others. Uh, but the Facebooks and the YouTubes really need that in place because they don't want liability and they're already spending as much as they're willing to spend on taking down radicalization, massacre videos, putting a kid's head on somebody else's naked body, whatever. Um, and so we're getting them to line up and do something and Congress is starting to listen. But the problem is people don't know about it. Yeah. And as long as they don't know about it, they're not gonna complain and make a lot of noise. So we're gonna start that education today. Yeah, I do wonder if the, you know, our, our congressional leaders tend to be older and I don't know if they're as up to up to date with what you can actually do with these platforms and how powerful they are. And many times the kids are as good at evading detection for the things they're doing or better than maybe their parents are trying to find out what their children are doing online. Um, is, is there a, uh, when I asked about an appetite, do you think we'll see a, a, a pushback into the corporate America? You think that, that they can be regulated or do you think it just has to be done like sort of under the FCC uh, constraints or something like that? Well, the Federal Trade Commission has something called COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy oh, Trade Protection Act. Yeah, uh, and they've now asked for comments from us as to whether it's good enough. And it regulates kids under the age of 13, preteens. So the question is, should it be for older kids as mm -hmm. old as 15, 16? Um, what do parents need notifications on? When do they have to give absolute consent? Um, and how much of that's privacy versus how much is safety? Mm -hmm. So we're now looking there's going to be a hearing in October, and a lot of us are putting in comments and see. And in other countries around the world, they're putting a lot, lot stricter rules now because everyone's concerned about what's happening to kids, and the trust of the industry seems to have been misplaced. Mm. Yeah, I was having a discussion that we haven't, we in, in the security sector, we sort of let cybersecurity get ahead of us by not paying attention to it for decades. And now the privacy discussion has also gotten in front of the security industry. And we didn't address it first, so it's going to be taught to us. And it seems that 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 idea could also be expanded into technology itself, where the because these things weren't taken care of, and because criminals learned how to leverage them against children and against all of us, for for that matter, you know, we've got to come backwards. And it it seems to take so much longer to fix something from the backside. And I I don't know if uh, in in your um, estimation or maybe changes to these laws to expand protection or expand the age groups they protect. Is this a decades long sort of battle we have to fight with the technology companies or is it something that you think can move a little quicker? Well, I think it's an ongoing battle. Um, mm. And there we do it from up, top down and from the middle in both directions. So <laughs> top down, we're looking at the government putting in new rules that looks like there's some uh, appetite for using digital best practices, cyber safety standards um, as a basis for what these in the industry players have to do. And it just so happens the new charity we're forming is putting those standards together. And I hope, Andrew, you're going to help us with that. And InfraGuard and everybody out in Hawaii that cares can weigh in as to what they need. We also need people to start talking about what's going on, what they like, what they don't like, what they want the schools to do, how better secure they need to be. And the middle in both directions, we need to start coming up with standards, training, and certifications in cyber safety in the same way we do in cyber security and privacy. So it's time not to think that that's just kids putting a computer in a central location. There's a lot more to it. We're talking about lives and the future reputations of our kids. Yeah, they. I think um, I do want to talk about them probably a little more in the second part of our of our of our broadcast today. But the the idea that parents or teachers or administrators for that matter think that we are supervising these kids very well. Um, I think that the, the, the kids are, are, are fairly adept at disguising things that they know are uh, on, the, on the edge of what they should or shouldn't be doing. Um, perhaps normal human, uh, uh, what is it, just like um, uh, desire, you know, or um, curiosity um, to explore things. Uh, takes takes these kids to places that are waiting for them, and and the kids just don't know that that's the intent of what's the, of the material that's there. Um, you know, this isn't 
Playboy magazine we used to hide under the mattress. We're talking about mm -hmm. the bad guys who go into our kids' bedrooms and their backpacks and our purses through these hand devices where our kids are taking pictures and sharing them and taking their clothes off at the age of 10 because somebody asked them to. We need to recognize that people are getting in our homes and our lives and into our children's hearts through this technology. And we need to train our kids directly. We need to train their friends how to keep them safe. And we need to know enough and be comfortable enough setting rules and saying, I'm the parent, I'm not your best friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to me how many, I see fairly young children with, with mobile phones and you know I think they're definitely under 10. And it, it kind of amazes me that uh, parents allow them to sort of, I see them just sitting around the mall or even sitting like after school around the school. And I, I'm stunned that, that, I think that there's a lack of knowledge out there. So we do have to work on it from all levels. Um, for sure. Um, what's been the sort of the biggest trend? Um, you know, I know that um, more and more uh, young adults are being targeted more and more often. And I know, so it seemed like cyberbullying was sort of on the radar for a while. What what other trend do you feel has uh, sort of risen up or, or, or is increasing that people aren't aware of? Well, sexting, sextortion, and sext bullying. Mm. So sexting, when kids are taking naked or sometimes sexually explicit and sometimes just suggestive images of themselves. You might find a group of 12 year old girls who want the attention of the seniors on the football team or a boy or a girl who are taking it because they're in love or they have a relationship. Boys do it to show everybody what they're missing. If they don't go out with them, girls do it often to get attention or because they're asked or being coerced. Those images get out um, unintentionally most of the time, but once they're out, they get into the hands of traditional sexual predators who are now blackmailing our kids for more images or to meet them in real life to engage in sex. Mm -hmm. And these predators, high school students or their peers who are blackmailing them as well. Um, and then we have sex bullying often by girls of other girls. They get a hold of these images or they'll manufacture them by taking a girl's head and putting it on somebody else's naked body mm. and they'll do it to destroy their reputation. Mm. This is something else. So we're talking with Perry Aftab here. We're talking about child exploitation and specifically the internet and child exploitation. Um, we're covering some great ground. We're going to take a break, pay some bills. We'll be back in one minute. Sit tight. Thanks to our Think Tech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Monley and the Friends of Think Tech the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Duane Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. And we're back with Security Matters Hawaii. And today we're talking with uh, expert Perry F. Tab about internet and child exploitation. Um, Perry, you've worked hard on the, on the laws in this country. Um, you, you've seen it evolve. Um, you've, t you've taken your focus from internet protection down to, I think, really protecting children on the internet. And I know um, we want to talk a little bit about the, the foundation that you're setting up. But I think uh, you mentioned something right before we went to break about the re the age ranges of some of these children that are maybe bullying each other, and then and then that that um, these images that they're taking or sharing are getting picked up by true predators who then start to blackmail them. Um, is this is this expanding? Are we getting kids younger and younger and younger? I mean, I said I've seen them, you know, very young children with these mobile phones, and I'm surprised that they have them. Should we just expect these trends to follow the, you know, the younger you give them, they're going to figure out how to do these things? Uh, yes, unfortunately. It's mm. not just a mobile phone. It's a lot of the tablets that parents think are harmless ah. with Wi-Fi phones. 
Um, and so I had lunch the other day with the head of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force here in New Jersey. And John was explaining to me that he's seeing sexting as young as eight and nine. Wow. Now, the youngest I is a 10 year old. And, you know, when they take off their clothes, frankly, they all look exactly alike at those <laughs> ages. Posing without bras when they don't need them. But they're doing it because they're being sexualized. Uh, the internet's forcing a lot of different looks and poses and, and the rest on them. And the yeah. demands are being made by boys and girls of each other. And the internet's an easy way to do it, somehow thinking that and what you do in the privacy of your bathroom or your bedroom and when no one else is looking doesn't count. But those images are real. Yeah, and they never go away. I saw Europol took down mm -hmm. a, a pretty large European group recently. Um, was the feeling from the, the task force director you spoke with is, is there a lot of this that's housed in the U.S. or is a lot of it going overseas or is it some of both? Well, sex trafficking tends to be housed uh, around the world less in the United States than it is in other places. There was years ago when UNESCO put me in charge of sexual crimes against children for the United States, a lot of it was being housed in Japan because they had faster and more secure networks. Ah. However, sexting issue that's now turning into a lot of images interpol had five million images mm. and they couldn't tell if they were sex trafficked images or kids who took them voluntarily because they had too much to drink at a party wow. so when law enforcement doesn't know to investigate and what to do about it we're in serious trouble yeah especially if the volume's that high are the um are the the providers the platform providers um, are they actively helping with these investigations when it comes their way? I know we, you know, we talked a little bit about how they don't really, they won't, don't want to be regulated, but are they willing to help uh, in these investigations in, in your experience when it comes their way? Or does it, do they have to be yeah, subpoenaed yeah, yeah. And, and drugged through court, you know? Well, most of them require a subpoena unless it's an exigent circumstance, a child who's missing, a child who's seriously at risk and you have enough. What we're doing as part of this new charity we're setting up is we're creating standards and I have some of the leading experts in the world working with me on creating what the standards need to be for the industry to work with law enforcement on investigations. So I have John Ryan, who headed the National Center for Missing Exploited Children, Bob Schilling, who Bob was seconded to Interpol for uh, the crimes against children. We have Ron Laney and Ron had run DOJ on these issues forever. And so many of the other experts, John Rouse out of Australia, RCMP, home office, we're all getting together. We're going to come up with what we think the rules should be. And I think enough of us make noise. They will become the rules. Good. And is the international community willing to play? I, I see more activity, truthfully, from Interpol and Europol about these sort of takedowns or these investigations and even publishing, hey, we're looking for people. I see Europol all the time posting, um, like, have you seen this vest or have you seen this, you know, if you can identify this this garment, let us know where you saw it or or a, a picture of a barn somewhere, uh, things like that. So is um, is it, it just seems like there's a great appetite internationally. Is, is there a lot of the traffic and activity running internationally? Is that why we need that that support? Or is it just more visible because they're crossing so many, I guess, legal, you know, um, I guess, I guess uh, n technology boundaries, right? You're, you're crossing different providers and things like that as you move material, you know, outside the U.S. into Europe, or, for example. Well, a lot of it has always come from outside of the U.S. KIPS, the very first uh, program to use things around you and environments to find sexual tra sexually trafficked kids came out of Canada with a plea to Bill Gates. Huh. Uh, but we're dealing with smaller countries, it's more obvious. The United States is very fractured. Uh, we tend to be less supportive of law enforcement in this country than we should be. Yeah. I think we tend to put up walls to law enforcement being able to get the information they want. Those walls don't exist as much outside of the United States. They tend to allow government, including law enforcement, to have more information than we're comfortable doing in the United States. That has to change. Frankly, um, as far as I'm concerned, kids are our top priority. Saving a life, uh, saving, saving a future for a child comes before politics. Yeah, and saving just one. You know, we've got a few thousand that live on the streets here in, in Hawaii, uh, in Honolulu, and um, it's sad. You know, there's a, there's a lot of outreach that goes out to them, but they're, you know, they're safer on the street than they feel like they are at home, and uh, so they just won't go home. Uh, and that's always a, a heartbreaking story. And they may be safer. 
they may be safer on the streets or at least a different kind of risk when you trust somebody and hope that they're going to love you and take care of you and they don't that betrayal is very different but even street children in delhi and in mumbai in india have access to cell phones that somebody's discarded and although they don't have health providers uh, they have sim cards and the sim cards are stored with grooming images of videos of children being raped that will help less perhaps their resistance to being the next victim. Wow, that's just so sad. Is um, what, uh, what levels of outreach are happening for the, for the kids? I know it, at some of the schools, and I don't know if it's private schools, public schools, what's your feeling about the outreach and the education? You know, are we just hitting them once a year at the beginning of the school year? Is there ongoing programs you're aware of that we could emulate and maybe talk about to educators here in Hawaii? I hate to keep saying our new charity. However, <laughs> no, please. Uh, <laughs> Whatever we've been doing for 25 years hasn't been working. Um, we have programs where kids teach each other. We teach 14 to 16 year olds to go down to the grammar schools and teach the other kids to be safer. Uh, my grandsons just started the cyber safety agents program this weekend where my grandson said he's the CEO. He's turning eight this week. Nice. Um, and he wants their kids to keep their homes more secure and keep an eye on the cyber bullies. We even have a, a therapy dog program that's the cyber safety service dog program where people who have therapy dogs can go into schools, hospitals, community groups. We'll teach them about the cyber safety messaging and they bring a dog to help the kids heal for all of the bad stuff that they may encounter. So we're gonna throw everything we can at the wall and whatever works, we're gonna keep. Um, and our model of we're all unpaid volunteers works pretty well. But Hawaii has been ignored far too often. Uh, you have a multicultural space it's really, you know, you've got Aboriginal values, you have really some amazing things as people come in from all over the world and build a community that protects their land, their ocean, and their children. So it's time we create something special. So you invite me out, we'll do some snorkeling, create some programs at the same time. Yeah, we'll have some, uh, an Aloha chapter for sure of your organization. I think the idea of kids teaching kids is so important because there's a there's a, a natural wall that drops i think when you are not an adult talking down to a child and not many of us are schooled in how to to teach children and we probably lapse into the you know talking down voice m maybe too quickly um uh, how's the success been i did see that you i saw your actually that your grandson posted that he was a ceo I was on linkedin i was amazed by that how's um so is this something that he's um he's gotten some experience with already has he been out talking to other folks um other he children? has and he's doing a lot more our teen angels program are 13 to 18 year old kids and they testify before congress they speak at the united nations they um, speak at Parliament and House of Lords. They create programs. They sit on boards. They have been the voice of this so, for so long. But now the younger kids are saying, wait a minute. You know, we want to make sure our house is safer. We want to make sure our friends are safer. We have a voice here. So we're using animations of the cyber safety service dog, teaching those kids about cyber safety so they can teach it to others. They'll get badges. I created many years ago the program for the Girl Scouts of the USA, and it's old and it's now down. I think it's time to do another one. We need to reach out to all of the groups, the faith-based groups, uh, youth pastors, uh, the, the scouts on both sides, any of the service organizations, 4-H, uh, anything that has kids together and let's arm them with the information they need to keep their own kids safe. Happy to share. I think it's a great idea. Uh, Perry, I, I look forward to helping out with this. Uh, we'll, we'll get the Hawaii chapter started for you. I truly appreciate you taking time to chat with us today. Uh, we've got about 30 seconds left if you want to make one last plug for the charity. Okay, brand new. Uh, the site's not even up other than watch this space. It's called cybersafety.org. We're all unpaid volunteers. We're going to be training and certifying and getting out there together. We're going to own this issue and we're going to keep our kids safe. And Andrew, I couldn't do it without you. We all need to work on this one together, folks. Uh, they said it, it takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a village to keep them safe as well. Thanks, everybody. We'll, we will not see you next week. We'll be at GSX. Uh, I, uh, Perry, I know you'll be up there speaking as well. Uh, so we'll be in Chicago, but uh, we'll be back in a few weeks. Thanks for joining us today. Aloha, everybody. Take care.